Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In this video, I'll discuss combinations. This material is from section 9.5 of the book. The corresponding homework is this rather large collection of exercises from section 9.5. I'll introduce the definition of what's called an R combination, and then I will be discussing how we count the number of R combinations, and I'll do some examples. Recall the definition of permutations and the formulas for the number of permutations from earlier videos. A permutation of a set is a choice of an ordering of the elements of a set. And what's called an R permutation of a set of n elements is an ordered selection of R elements taken from that set of n elements. So uh, that includes the previous definition. That is, if a set has n elements, then a permutation of that set is the same thing as an n permutation of that set. The number of r permutations of a set of n elements is denoted by this symbol. And in section 9.2, we found that the number of r permutations is given by this formula, n factorial over n minus r factorial. Section 9.5 is about combinations. Here's the definition. An R combination of a set of N elements is an unordered selection of R elements taken from that set of N elements. In other words, it's simply a subset containing R elements. The number of R combinations of a set of N elements is denoted by this symbol, capital C parentheses N comma R, it's also denoted by this symbol, parentheses, and then n above r inside the parentheses. That's not a fraction. It's just an n sitting above the r. This is spoken n choose r. The book uses this notation, and this notation is quite common. But this notation is also nice, and I like it because it can be written on a single line and also because you can enter this formula into uh, computer systems, into web pages that will do calculations for you. A natural question is, what's the formula for the number of R combinations of a set of N elements? Well, it turns out that we can figure out a formula by considering the relationship between the number of R combinations and the number of R permutations. We already know that the formula for the number of R permutations of a set of N elements is, is this. P parentheses N comma R is N factorial over N minus R factorial. Now let's consider arriving at that number by considering tasks. So we're going to imagine the task of choosing an R permutation as two subtasks. So task number one is going to be choose a subset of R elements from the set of N elements. In other words, choose an R combination of the set of N elements. Now, how many ways can that be done? Well, let's give that a name. We can't use the letter N for the number of ways. Let's use the number K. Now, that's actually something that we don't know a value for. That's why we're doing this. We're trying to figure out how many of those uh, R combinations there are. We do have a symbol for that, though, so let's just write down the symbol. The number of ways of doing task one, that is the number of ways of choosing a subset of R elements from a set of N elements, is, is this, C parentheses N comma R. Task number two is to choose an ordering of the elements of that subset of R elements. Well, that just means that we're going to choose a permutation of those R elements. And so the number of ways of doing that is R factorial. Now, that means that the total number of ways of choosing an R permutation is The number of ways is C parentheses N comma R times R factorial. But wait a minute, we already know the total number of ways of choosing an R combination. 
we knew it back there. So that means that we have an equation relating CNR and PNR. Therefore, we can solve this for CNR. That's the, the quantity that we're interested in. And we arrive at this formula, that the number of R combinations is this factorial expression. What we've just done amounts to a proof of theorem 9.5.1. The number of R combinations that can be chosen from a set of N elements is given by this formula. C parentheses N comma R, which is also denoted by this symbol, spoken N choose R, is given by this formula. N factorial over R factorial times N minus R factorial. Now, of course, n and r have to be non-negative integers. You can't have a set with a negative number of elements. And uh, you can't have a subset with a negative number of elements. And furthermore, of course, r has to be less than or equal to n. Now, many of the homework problems on the homework set, homework 9.5, involve problems very similar to book examples. I don't intend to present similar examples in this video because I want you to read those book examples very carefully. In general, the book is, is written better than I can, can speak and better than I can write. So I, I really want you to, to, to work on the skill of reading the textbook, especially when the examples are so close to the homework problems. But some of the homework exercises involve significant variations from anything presented in the book and have tricky solutions. And some of the exercises, though not tricky, do warrant some discussion. So for that reason, I'll present examples similar to four of the homework problems. Example one is similar to 9.5 number five. Find these quantities. Question A, uh, this quantity is spoken uh, nine choose six. Now I'm going to also uh, give the other symbol for this. C parentheses nine comma six. Let's use the formula. So our result is that 9 choose 6, or C parentheses 9 comma 6, is equal to 84. Now, notice that it seems kind of lucky that all of these things canceled. Uh, it looks like we're going to end up with a fraction from that messy expression. But miraculously, all of the, the terms in the denominator canceled. Will it always end up that way? Or will we sometimes actually end up with the fraction? Well, we should never end up with a fraction because we're counting the number of subsets. So that's going to be an integer. How many subsets you have is always going to be an integer. You can't have a fractional number of subsets. All right, question B. 9 choose 3. We arrive at this expression. 9 factorial over 3 factorial, 6 factorial. Notice that expression is exactly the same as this one. So they're going to have the same value. So we've also proven a little fact here. We could write it off to the side. n choose r is the same as n choose n minus r. Let's go on. The result is that 9 choose 8 is just the number 9. Does that make sense? Well, remember what that symbol stands for. It's the number of ways of choosing a subset of 8 elements from a set of nine elements. How many ways could you do that? Well, think about this. If you want to choose a subset of eight elements from a set of nine elements, 
you could do that this way. You could just think of choosing the one thing that you're going to leave out. One of those nine elements is going to have to be omitted from that set. So there are nine elements that we can choose from as the, as the one that's going to be left out. So that means that there are nine ways of choosing a subset of eight elements. Another way of uh, writing in symbols what we just observed is this. We've just observed that 9 choose 8 equals 9 choose 1. It's the number of ways of choosing one element from a set of 9. So the number of ways of choosing a subset of 8 elements is the same as the number of ways of choosing a single element that's going to be left out of that subset. Finally, question D. 9 choose 9. So a key thing in this calculation is to remember that 0 factorial is the number 1. 0 factorial is not 0. When you remember that, then we end up with this result that 9 choose 9 is the number 1. Now why does that make sense? That's the number of ways of choosing a subset of 9 elements from a set of 9 elements. Well, there's no choice there. You've got to choose the whole, the whole set as going to be your subset. Uh, we also could observe this. Nine choose nine is the same as nine choose zero because of this fact that we noticed a while ago. Well, nine choose zero is the number of ways of choosing a set with no elements. Well, there's only one way to do that. It's the empty set. So uh, that nine choose zero is also one. That's the end of that example. Let's go on. Example two is similar to 9.5 number 12. How many triples of integers chosen from this set, one to 1,001, have a sum that's odd. Now by triples, we mean a set of three integers. So order is not important and repetition is not allowed. So in other words, we're looking for a set of three integers chosen from that set of 1001 integers. So in other words, triples of integers means set of three integers. Now, there are two different kinds of sets of three integers that will have this property. One kind of set is the set where all three integers are odd. The other kind of set, the other kind of triple, is a triple where two of the integers are even and one is odd. So we're going to have to count the number of triples of type A and count the number of triples of type B. Those are disjoint sets. So if we count the number of triples of type A and the number of triples of type B, we can just simply add them up to get the total number of triples that we're interested in. Now, in order to do that, either one of those, we're going to need to know two things. We're going to need to know how many even integers are there in this original set and how many odd integers are in that original set. Let's call that set x. Now to answer the question about the number of even integers, let's make a, a list of the even integers. You can see that the even integers in that set, in the set x, are going to be those green circled numbers. And you can see that there are 500 even integers. We also need to know the number of odd integers in set x. Well, let's count them in the same methodical way. Let's make an index and uh, then show the resulting odd integers. So there's my list of odd integers, 1, 3, 
5, and so on, all the way up to 1001. And you can see how we got those. We took these index numbers and we built odd integers by uh, the formula 2k plus 1. An odd number is the, of the form 2k plus 1, where k is an integer. Now the question is, how many index numbers are there in that list? Well, remember, the number of index numbers in this list is clearly 500. We counted from 1 to 500. So the number of index numbers in that red list is going to be 501. So now we know the number of even integers in set x, and we know the number of odd integers in set x. Now we're ready to, to count uh, set A and count set B. We'll do that on the next page. So we're going to count set A. We need a symbol for the number of elements in set A. Let's use the usual symbol. Now, how are we going to get that? Well, we know that there are 501 odd integers, and we need to choose a subset of three of those odd integers to be in a, in a triple. So the number of such triples will be this. So there's our result. The number of triples in set A is 20,833,250. Now you can see how I got that number. I built the expression for 501 choose 3 in terms of factorials, and then I simplified it. But the last step I just typed into a, a, a calculator, actually a web page that would do a calculation for me. Now it's good to know how to do this by hand. It's good to know how to simplify these expressions to understand what these expressions mean. And also, there are some calculations where you're not dealing with actual numbers, but, but symbols, like letters n in these expressions instead of actual integers. So in those situations, you're going to have to know how to simplify these expressions. But it's also good to know some web pages that will do this sort of calculation for you. Uh, of course, the, the, maybe the most popular one is Wolfram Alpha. Let's look at that for the same calculation. You can type this same expression into Wolfram Alpha and just get the same result, 20,833,250. What's nice about this is Wolfram Alpha also tells you what it thinks you're asking for. So it told me that it thought I was asking for the value of 501 choose 3. So, again, good to know how to use computer skills web pages to do these kinds of calculations. Now let's count set B, the number of triples that have two even integers and one odd integers. We could approach this two ways. We could think of identifying tasks and then use the multiplication rule, or we could just jump to the multiplication rule. So I'm going to write down my tasks and the result as well. So there's our result. Task one is to choose two even integers. The number of ways of doing that task is that. Choose a set of two numbers from a set of 500. The number of ways of doing task two, choosing one odd integer, is denoted this way. And of course, that's just going to be the number 501, the number of ways of choosing a set containing one integer from a set of 501 integers is just going to be 501. But I wanted to point out that you can uh, really approach these, these calculations without having to think too much about what the numbers actually are. Just make sure that you get the calculations set up correctly. And in fact, we can type this expression into Wolfram Alpha. Let's do that now. We see the result is 62,499,750. So 
So the total number of triples is the number of elements in set A plus the number of elements in set B. Now that calculation looks like it's going to be a nuisance. I've got to add that number to that number. But remember, we've got this number sitting in Wolfram Alpha, just been computed for us. Let's just have Wolfram Alpha do the whole thing. There's a number of elements in set B. We just did that. Let's add to this the number of elements in set A. Remember what that was. It was 501 choose 3. And so we see that the result is 83,333,000. That's the end of that example. Let's go on. Example 3. This is similar to 9.5 number 16. A jar contains a total of 100 jelly beans. Seven are black licorice flavored, which is a vile flavor, I'm sure you'll agree, and should not even be used as a flavor of candy. A sample of 10 beans is to be taken from the jar. How many different 10 bean samples are possible? Well, this is a pretty straightforward problem. We just need to choose a subset of 10 beans from a set of 100 beans. So there's the calculation set up. I wrote down the formula um, f involving the factorials. But let's just use Wolfram Alpha to do this. So you see the result is enormous. 17 trillion, 310 billion, 309 million, 456,440. Quite a mouthful. Question B. How many different tin bean samples are possible that do not contain any licorice flavored beans? Well, how do we do that? Let's go back up and look at the problem. We have 100 jelly beans in the jar. Seven are black licorice flavored. So if we're going to end up with a sample that does not have any black licorice flavor, then we have to imagine taking out those seven beans. So there are going to be 93 left. So we're going to choose a set of 10 beans from a set of 93. Let's do that in, in Wolfram. So the result is 8 trillion 79 billion 421 million 7658 Let's go on. C. How many 10 bean samples will contain at least one licorice flavored bean? Well, here we'll use the the difference rule. Let's uh, draw a diagram. So there's a picture of our situation. The large set is the set we talked about in question A, the set of all 10 bean samples. The green set is the set that we talked about in, in question B, the set of samples that have no black licorice flavored beans. Question C, we're being asked about how many samples will contain at least one licorice flavored bean. So we could call that A minus B. So uh, we want to count that by using the difference rule. Now that's going to be those huge numbers from A and B subtracted. Now I don't even want to take the time to write those down because I would probably mess them up. In my sleep deprived state I tend to write down these numbers incorrectly. And you should not really aspire to write that kind of stuff down correctly in your own work. I mean you'll have to write stuff like that down to type stuff into uh, computer program sometimes, or into into WebAssign, for instance. But if we want to compute this number, let's have let's have Wolfram do it for us. Let's just have Wolfram do the same calculation that we did in A and B together. In one fell swoop. So there's the calculation of C parentheses 93 comma 10. Let's just put in front of this. 
c parentheses 100 comma 10 and subtract. Wolfram confirms what we asked for and we get this answer. 9 trillion 230 billion 888 million 448,782. Let's go on. Question D. What's the probability that a randomly chosen 10 bean sample will contain at least one licorice flavored bean? Well, here we'll use the equal probability rule. Now remember, when we use that rule and simplify it, we end up with this expression. The probability of A minus B is 1 minus the number of elements in B divided by the number of elements in A. Remember what that is, that's 1 minus the probability of B. That's the complement rule. You don't really need to remember the complement rule when it's so easy to just get to it from using the equal probability rule. But there's what we need to do. Now, we can just, uh, instead of typing in those gigantic numbers, again, here we can just simply have Wolfram do this from scratch. Here's what we'll type in. We'll type that expression into Wolfram. Notice that it confirms what it thinks we're asking for, and that's correct. And we see the decimal approximation is roughly 0.53. Now it's this crazy big uh, fraction, so I'll actually write the exact result first, and then the decimal approximation. And there's our result. The, uh, the probability is roughly 0.53. Let's go on. Example 4. How many distinguishable ways can the letters of the word Massachusetts be arranged in an ordered list? Well, what does that mean? How many distinguishable ways can the letters of that word be arranged? Well, notice the, the number of, of letters that we've got to deal with. Let's make a list of those letters in alphabetical order. I'll do that over here on the left side of the page. there are 13 letters. Now, how do we figure out the number of distinguishable ways? We can think of this in terms of tasks. We can think about filling uh, blanks. We have 13 blanks to fill. And we get to put these letters in those blanks. So task one could be choose the locations for the A's. Now the number of ways that we can do that is, well, we're choosing two blanks from a, a total of 13 blanks. And then we're going to choose the spots for the C's. Now there's only one C, but we only have 11 blanks left, so, so the, uh, uh, the number of ways is going to be this. From, uh, an, from those 11 remaining blanks, we get to choose one of them for the C. Of course, this expression is just going to mean the number 11, but I'm just going to leave that as the, as the abstract expression. And then we're going to choose the spot for the E's. Well, we have 10 remaining blanks, and we have to choose one of them for our E. Then we have to choose a spot for the H. There are nine remaining blanks. We've got to choose one of those for the H. Choose a spot for the M. There are eight remaining blanks, so we have to choose one blank for the M. Now to choose the spots for the S's, we have seven remaining blanks, and we need to choose four of them for the S's. And then choose the spot for the two T's. At this point, we only have uh, three remaining blanks, and then finally choose the spot for the U. Of course, there's only one blank left, and there's only one blank we need for that U, but I'm going to go ahead and write down that abstract expression that, that represents that number. 
So the total number of ways is the product of all these. So that's the number that we're interested in. Let's have Wolfram do that calculation. Now there you see I've typed in the entire expression. And of course, some of those are kind of silly. I typed in that C parentheses 1 comma 1. That's just the number 1. And I typed in you know C parentheses 10 comma 1. That's just the number 10. But I want to remind you that you know you you can focus on writing down the correct abstract expression in some of these and not think about simplifying them since you have computer tools that will do all the dirty work for you and there's uh, the answer we're going to let Wolfram do it and we get the following we get this number you can see there's our expression uh, echoed back to us using the 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 n choose r notation and we get the answer is 64,864,800 now what we just did is the essence of theorem 9.5.2 uh, permutations with sets of indistinguishable objects suppose a collection consists of n objects of which n1 are of type 1 which are indistinguishable from each other. N2 are, are of type 2 and are indistinguishable from each other, and so on, all the way up to NK, which are of type K, and are indistinguishable from each other. And suppose that the sum of those numbers, N1 plus N2 all the way up to plus NK, equals the number N. Then the total number of distinguishable permutations of those N objects is this expression, which would simplify to this. I didn't do any of the simplification, but you can imagine that when you attack this problem, if you wrote out the factorial expressions for all of those, it would, uh, it would simplify drastically to this. So that's exactly what we did up above. So again, what they're saying is that this would have simplified to the following. Apparently, 13 factorial over 2 factorial, 4 factorial, 2 factorial would give us this number. Hey, let's check that out. So that's going to be 13 factorial over 2 times 24 times 2. And there you see we get the exact same answer. So using this formula, gives the same answer. But I like to think of it the way that we did so that we understand uh, the why the numbers work out the way they do. I always prefer to set things up, think about the tasks, and arrive at our own formula. Let's go on. Question B. How many distinguishable orderings begin with an M and end with an S? Well, let's go back up to the first page. Let's think about the same collection of blanks and this same collection of letters. In fact, I'm going to copy that to the page that we are working on now. We scroll back down, we'll find it there. So there is the information from question A, the list of letters with their uh, frequencies, and then the set of blanks. I'm going to move these blanks over a little bit to make room for a new count of letters. So in our, uh, our orderings that we're interested in this problem, we have to have an M at the beginning and an S at the end. And so that's going to affect our count of available letters. So in question A, we had those counts uh, indicated in that column. In question B, we have different counts. We only have 11 letters left. We have uh, 11 blanks to fill as well. So we get to choose spots for these letters in these quantities. So we can actually just jump to the final formula knowing what how this is going to work out. 
That is, we can use this formula from that theorem. n factorial divided by the product of the factorials of the individual terms. So there is the number. Now I could type that whole thing into the, the calculator. It would take me longer to, to do that than it would to just simplify a little bit. Remember that one factorial is just the number one. And also, zero factorial is the number one. So what we end up with is this. Eleven factorial over twenty-four. Let's type that into a calculator. The result is 1,663,200. Let's go on. Question C. How many distinguishable orderings contain the letters CH next to each other in order, and also the letters TT next to each other in order? Well, let's start by bringing the uh, information from the previous question down so that we can make use of it. So I'm going to copy this stuff and bring it down to the next page. We'll find it there when we scroll down. So there's the information from question B. Now here in question C, we're still going to have 13 blanks, but we're going to have a different set of letters available. Basically, we should think of our C and our H as being tied up by being next to each other. So we're going to deal with them. They're going to be kind of out of play. And we should think of our two T's as being out of play as well. So in question C, our number of available letters is going to be the following. That list of letters that are going to need to be placed, in addition to placing the C and the H. Now, here it gets very interesting. Uh, we have to think about um, two different possibilities. Let's think about, first of all, placing the CH. That'll be our first task. And then the next task will be placing the TT. And then our next task will be placing all those other letters. So we really have three tasks. First task is to place the CH letters. Then task two is to place the TT letters. And then task three is to place the nine other letters. The difficulty with this is that the number of ways of doing task two depends on how task one was chosen. Let me elaborate that. Uh, let me uh, do that on the next page. So when doing task one, we, we get to place CH in, in, in some blanks. We have to choose location for the CH. So basically, we just choose a location for the C, and then the H has to go right next to it. Well, if you think about the places where these letters can go, they can go there with the C in the blank numbered 1. They could go here in the C with the blank numbered 4. They could go all the way over on the right with the C in the blank numbered 12. But the C can't go in blank 13 because the H has to go next to it. So the number of ways of doing task 1 is 12. Now let's consider task 2 choosing the location for the two t's. So we're going to choose the location for the left t. The other one's going to go next to it. Now we're going to need some copies of those blanks. I'm going to put the copies on the next page to show you the different ways that this, that this can play out. So I'm going to copy these blanks and 
we'll scroll down to the next page and find them there. So there is a bunch of copies of our blanks. Now, what I want to do is I want to consider task two, where I'm choosing the location for the leftmost T, but depending on where CH is. So in the first case, let's have CH in the far left. So we have to figure out where to put the leftmost T. Now that T can't go here because we've got to put two T's side by side. So that means that the leftmost T can go in any of those blanks. Well, we've got 13 blanks and we lost three of them. So we have 10 remaining, 10 available spots. Similarly, suppose CH is in the far right. Well, we lose two blanks because of the C and the H, as we did in the previous situation. And we lose a blank there because the leftmost T can't go there. So we have these blanks available. 10 spots. OK, now let's consider CH not on the ends. Now, it might seem like we have to consider a whole bunch of cases, but I think you'll see pretty quickly that we don't have to. Let's consider CH going there, for instance, or maybe here, somewhere in the middle. How many spots do we lose? Well, we've lost two spots because of the CH. And we lose another spot just to the left of the C because the leftmost T can't go there. And we lose another spot way over here on the far right because the leftmost T can't go there. So that leaves nine spots for the leftmost T. Now consider this last configuration where CH is, is not on either end. It's out in the middle somewhere. Think about how many spots we lose. The leftmost T can't go there. The leftmost T can't go there. And that leaves us with nine remaining spots for the leftmost T. So the only special cases we need to consider are the cases where CH is on the end. That is, the C went either in blank 1 or in blank 12. That's one special situation. The other special situation is where the CH is not on the end. That's pictures like this. In that case, the C went in blank 2 all the way up to blank 11, could be the, the, the most far right that the C could go. So let's regroup and remember what we're doing. We're trying to think of how many distinguishable orderings there are that contain CH next to each other and also the letters TT next to each other. And now we realize that there are two important flavors of those. CH next to each other with the CH on either the far left or the far right. That is the C in blank 1 or in blank 12. That's one flavor of ordering. And the other flavor of ordering is this flavor where the C is in one of the blanks from 2 through 11. Uh, all right, so now let's think about counting these. So we can think of um, the orderings with C in the far left, CH in the far left, that's at C in blank 1. The orderings with CH in the far right, that is with C in the blank 12. And then the orderings with CH somewhere in the middle, that is with C in blanks 2 to 11. So let's call this um, A union B union C. So let's count the number of uh, orderings in set A.
So, so far we have four tasks. Choose the spot for the C, well it's got to go on the far left. And then choose the spot for the H, it's got to go next to the C. So there's, there's no choice about those, there's only one way to do those tasks. Then we discussed how in that first scenario, there are 10 available spots for the leftmost T. So that's why N3 equals 10. But choosing the spot for the right T, there's only one spot for it. It's got to go next to the left T. Now what we need to do is choose the spot for the other letters. Now what are the other letters? There. We've got some uh, two A's, we've got one E, we've got one M, one S, uh, sorry, four S's, and one U. Total of nine letters. So we need to choose spots for the A's, the E's, the M, the S's, and the U. And the number of ways of doing that is that same formula that we that we arrived at earlier from that theorem. We have a total of nine blanks to put uh, nine letters in, but there are certain types of letters, uh, A's, E's, M's, S's, and U's, appearing with those multiplicities, these multiplicities. So when we use this formula with those multiplicities, we arrive at this number. And so the total number of elements in set A is the product of those. That's going to be n parentheses A. We see that the result is uh, 10 factorial over 48, which is 75,600. All right, that's the number of elements in set A. Now we have to count the number of elements in set B. Well, that's going to be the exact same number. We'll do that on the next page. Now we need to count the number of elements in set C. Set C is... Um, the orderings that have the letter C in blanks 2 through 11. Now I'm going to go up and copy all the stuff that we just did for counting the number of elements in set A. I'm going to copy all this stuff and bring it down and modify it. We'll scroll down and find it there. So there I've copied down all the stuff. Well, now we need to revise the number of ways of doing these tasks. Task number one is to choose a spot for letter C. Now remember, in set C, the letter C can go anywhere in blanks 2 through 11. That is a, a, a collection of 10 possible blanks. So I modified that number. C can go any of those 10 locations. Now, uh, what about uh, the spot for the, the H? Well, the H has to go next to the C, so this number's okay. Now, what about the spot for the leftmost T? Remember what we found earlier. In these orderings where C is not on the end, there are only nine spots available for the leftmost T. So we have to change this number to 9. And then where does the T have to go? The other T has to go just next to the left T, so that number doesn't change. What about the other letters? The A, the E, the M, the S, the U. Well, those still have uh, 9 available blanks, and there are 9 available characters, but they're in different flavors. So this formula still holds. So our formula is now the following. So 10 times 9 times 9 factorial. So it's going to be the exact same thing we had before, but there is an extra factor of 9 there that was not in the previous page. So that extra factor of 9 that we didn't have in the previous uh, counting of uh, set 
on this here we're counting set C so that number nine that was not there when we were counting the number of elements in set A that number nine shows up there and shows up there so we just take the result from set A and multiply it by nine all right so we've counted set A set B set C so the total number of distinguishable orderings will be S. It'll be the, uh, the sum of the numbers in A, B, and C. Notice that the number of elements in set B was exactly the same as the number of elements in set A, and that the number of elements in set C was nine times the number of elements in set A. So the total is going to be 11 times the number of elements in set A. So there we see that the total is 831,600. That's the total number of orderings. The total number of orderings containing CH next to each other and also the letters TT next to each other in that order. That's the end of that question, that's the end of the example, and that's the end of the video. Thank you.